Okay, ladies and gentlemen, the uh, powers that be at Humboldt State University and our general education department have decreed that thou shalt learn about science and the scientific method. And that's why maybe you're taking this class. And so let's just address this right up front, take care of it, line it up, and knock it down. Here we have a picture of a bunch of interesting people, all of whom are scientists. And um, oh, you don't have to know them, but if you're interested in doing a little research, they all have very interesting stories behind them. I'm just going to point out two. One, Beatrix Potter. Now you probably know her from the Beatrix Potter books. Uh, who were they? They were the um, Peter Rabbit and Farmer McGregor, two characters I remember, um, and the tale of Benjamin Bunny. Well, she was a children's uh, illustrator, but she was also a botanist, a really good botanist. She studied lichens and other small plants, and uh, but she was barred from presenting them because of the patriarchal discrimination of her time. Uh, but if you look at her book, she actually has lots of good scientific illustrations mixed in. Um, the other person I wanted to point out down here um, being arrested is James Hansen, who is a very fine scientist, s scientist who works for NASA doing atmospheric science. And uh, he works for our government. He's uh, really got a long, distinguished career and uh, becoming concerned about carbon dioxide emissions and its effect on climate. He was um, inspired to take a direct political action, which I think is a really interesting thing for a science scientist to do. Scientists try to be unbiased in their professional lives, but acting as a private citizen, uh, of course we're biased and, and we're allowed to take action. And here's a cool song if you really want to have a funny song about that, just, uh, just uh, Google it and listen to it. So uh, what are we going to do here? Here's what I want you to learn um, in this presentation. And before I go on, let me just say, this presentation is a little bit long for an online presentation. I don't know how long it's going to take, maybe 30 minutes or so. And um, the uh, specialists who I talk to say that students can't concentrate for more than 15 minutes. And I don't know if that's true or not. But regardless, if you feel your attention is wavering, you have the control. Hit the pause button get up, walk around, and come back and finish it whenever you like. So make sure you pay attention and you get the stuff in this lecture. It's important. So here's what I want you to get out of today's talk. Uh, a definition of the term science. Uh, to be able to distinguish the word science from technology. To understand how we come to believe what we know. Uh, assuming that science has something to do with knowing stuff. How do we come to believe what we know? That'll make sense as we get to it. Understand the assumptions behind the scientific method. There are some. And understand the components of critical thinking. Critical thinking, a term you may have come up par upon in your education. We think it's important that uh, students learn critical thinking skills. Well, what are they? Uh, they are certainly applied in the scientific method, so you might as well know what they are. Know the basic steps in the scientific method what happens after the experiment is completed. And I want to give you some of the social context of science. And uh, I think that should be particularly interesting to a number of members of this class who are social, uh, social workers, people who are studying sociology and psychology. Uh, sci you are scientists, you're practicing science, and you're interested in social uh, interactions. And so I thought this would be interesting. By the way, many scientists don't really pay much attention to this. Uh, but I think it's important to raise and think about. OK, so first, let's define science. First of all, two, two aspects of science. One, it is a systematic method for learning about the world and testing our understanding of it. So the main thing here is the word method, this is a systematic method. And you probably already know most of it. Uh, it's often taught in the grade school level, certainly at the high school level, and again and again, and maybe in every science class that's ever taught. But let's just make sure you got it down pat. And furthermore, science is also the body of knowledge itself derived from the method of the type that can be rationally explained and reliably applied. So the body of knowledge. So I've put in a, a pyramid here, the pyramid of science. And every little brick here uh, represents a, an experimental, uh, a scientific method in use that re yielded a publication. And so there's been lots and lots of scientists doing work. And 
all the new stuff on top relies on all the stuff that comes before. So this is the body of knowledge and every little uh, brick in it represents the systematic method that was applied in science. Okay, two parts, a method, and the body of knowledge itself. Make sure you got that. Let's uh, address the difference between science and technology because I think in the press and in common usage the two are commonly confused. They are not the same thing. Number one, science is as I have already defined, the method and the body of knowledge derived from the method. And technology is then the tools and techniques used to solve a problem. So uh, they are not the same thing. Do not confuse them. Science sometimes serves technology very frequently. Uh, let's say we need to make a better bandsaw. Um, maybe someone has an idea that if they include a different alloy, the bandsaw saw will be better. They will apply the scientific method to test their hypothesis that this new alloy will work. And uh, through experimentation, they will determine how to make a better bandsaw. The reverse is also true that technology serves science. An example is, well, uh, a couple hundred years ago, we didn't have very good microscopes. We had light microscopes made from glasses and lenses and metal, um, but we then discovered electricity and we de de discovered how to use the electron, uh, electron microscopy. And that is an example of technology. And now that we have really good uh, microscopes, we can actually see viruses, even molecules, even atoms, things we couldn't do before. So in this case, clearly, science has served science. So you can see why they sometimes get confused. But I want you to be sure you know the difference. Okay, I wanted to talk about how science is used uh, because it's important socially. There are two general categories of how science is used. Number one is it's used simply to satisfy our curiosity. How does the world work? Uh, the, uh, the cosmos, the origin of the universe, those questions uh, are addressed through the scientific method. Uh, don't maybe, maybe they don't have any practical application, but it's really interesting to think where did the universe come from uh, and to apply the scientific method to answer that. So simple curiosity. Number two, to develop something useful. So some examples of how science can be used to develop something useful. An antibiotic. So we have these diseases, Staphylococcus aureus, um, tuberculosis, whatever that is. Um, can we find antibiotics to cure diseases? Clearly that's useful, um, reducing human suffering. How about a better iPad, a better tablet display? Uh, we could use uh, science to test new parts of tablets and improve the display, make it last longer, make it brighter, better colors, make it touch sensitive. Uh, so that really, I would say, would be an example of commercial interest. So science can be used to make more profits, to stay competitive. Uh, so that's not necessarily to improve human welfare, but to make money. Maybe they're linked, maybe not. Thirdly, how about a better kind of weapon? And you can be sure that we spend a lot of money using science to develop better weaponry. There's always going to be arms races uh, uh, for whatever reason. And so I think it's important to acknowledge that a large part of the United States budget goes to fund the military and a big fund, uh, wedge of that goes to support research to improve our military capability. Okay, so uh, today, what are some of the main uses of science and technology? Medicine, military, as already mentioned, corporate profits, already mentioned these, human welfare, uh, and then lastly, uh, people who are interested in just basic science, like um, what about those fungi on tree roots? What are they actually doing? Uh, and these are not always easily related to human welfare, corporate profits, military, or medicine, but they expand our understanding of the world. Sometimes they have great spin-off, and then sometimes they don't, and yet we are enriched, in my humble opinion, in, in that kind of information. I want to reveal my bias here. This is the part of science I'm actually most interested in. I'm not so interested in developing antibiotics, better tablet displays, better bombs and medicines. I'm really interested in bugs and creatures. That's my personal bias, but uh, other people do things for other reasons. I just wanted to give you some of uh, a sense of the breadth of how science and technology are used. So 
Changing subjects, and by the way, if you feel tired and you're losing your concentration, now is a good time to take a break. Pause button, get up, walk around, and come on back. But right now, what I want to do is to address a sort of deeper question, how we come to believe what we think is true. We may never really know the truth, but we think we know the truth. We believe we know the truth. Well, how did we come to believe that? We sort of take that for granted sometimes, and even in the scientific realm, of course, we think, well, science tells us it's true, so it must be true. Well, let's take a close look at that. I've come up with a list of several ways we come to believe what we think is true. Um, one is by faith, complete trust or confidence in someone or something. Uh, if science has told me that um, uh, all life is composed of living cells, well, maybe I believe that that is true um, because I have faith in that. I have complete trust or confidence in uh, a person or a book or something like that. So just through faith. Through personal experience. Maybe uh, every time I get that rash, it's fall. And so I believe that falls cause rash. I don't know. Um, anyway, you know personal experience is very strong and it's really hard to um, make someone disbelieve something from their personal experience. Even if the personal experience might be just coincidental and there's not truly cause and effect. Authority. Uh, and we do this a lot. There's many sources of authority. It begins with our parents when we're babies. Our parents tell us this, that, or the other thing, and we believe them. Or it may be that um, uh, you take a, a, a class and your teacher assigns you a textbook, and this is big, fat, $200 textbook. The book itself can become an authority. The Bible is an authority to many people. The Koran, the Koran. Um, so we often believe what the authorities, the people or mm, sources of information we invest with authority, we believe that whatever they say is true without really critically thinking about it maybe. So that could be a person or a group of people or a convincing book or what about the internet? <laughs> well, that's kind of a loaded question. We'll talk about Wikipedia later on in this course. Sometimes we just logic our way to something without any personal experience, without anybody telling us, without any faith in something, we just logic our way to a conclusion and, and come to think of it as true. Uh, watch Sherlock Holmes sometimes. He's really good at that. Uh, and if you want a humorous uh, application of that, Google the she's a witch scene from Monty Python and the Holy Grail and there's a really funny misapplication of logic there. Um, and then, so let's take a look at experimentation. Experimentation is really a mixture of logic, of authority, and personal experience. Let's start with personal experience. You set up the experiment to begin with because maybe you've had some personal experience with something that leads you to a hypothesis. Uh, maybe you've done your research and uh, you've consulted the local authorities or, or the authorities on the subject area you're interested in. And then you to design an experiment based upon that information. And of course you apply logic in setting up your experimentation. So experimentation is a mixture of all these things. It is a way to figure out what is true. There are many ways to come to believe what we think is true. I just wanted to say that science is only one way of coming to understand the truth. There are other ways, but I want to emphasize that science is a very powerful way of coming to an understanding of truth. Through the application of the scientific method, we have discovered antibiotics that have cured us of diseases, vaccinations that have eradicated, for instance, uh, smallpox, and um, uh, we've also developed very terrible things such as nuclear weapons and who knows, maybe even the whole industrial revolution is a terrible thing, but it was derived from science. So it's extremely powerful and that's why it shows up in your general education curriculum as something important to learn about. It does have some assumptions that underlie it and there are three of them and I think it's important to consider them. Number one, the universe works according to unchanging natural laws. Well, that's pretty cool. Uh, scientists uh, are famous in coming up with uh, laws like thermodynamic laws or gravitational theory. And uh, the assumption behind these things is that these are unchanging. 
if we have uh, agreed to call something a natural law, then we assume that it has been in place since the beginning of the universe at least and has unchanged since then. If that's not the case, a lot of our science falls apart. So that's interesting to think about. Number two, uh, events arise from causes and they cause other events. In other words, there is cause and effect in the world. So for instance, uh, a scientist goes out and sees peacocks and notices that um, the peacocks, the males, have these ridiculously colorful displays, huge feathers that make it really hard for them to fly and get around and actually make them a pretty easy prey for predators maybe. Uh, but the females don't have those things. Why is that? That question, why is that, is based upon an assumption that there, the universe exists with cause and effect. Things don't just happen. Uh, that uh, there, if there uh, is something funny going on, there must be a cause. And so scientists are always looking for the uh, cause of observed effects. And lastly, we can understand natural processes by using our senses and reason, by looking and recording and using logic to try to figure out what's going on. Now it's possible that we can't. Maybe there's things that we cannot observe or that don't apply, where the rules of logic don't apply. Uh, I'm not quite sure where those would be because we can't see them. Um, and maybe some of our, our uh, ideas sort of bump into our limits of our ability to sense things. For instance, maybe you've heard of string theory. Uh, string theory that posits multiverses, multiple universes, and uh, multiple dimensions. And uh, since we don't have senses that can perceive these things, maybe we just can't come to understand them. But uh, we try the best we can, and these are the three assumptions of the scientific method. This is a good time to take a break, if you want to, uh, because you really should focus and concentrate on this next part. Critical thinking permeates the academic curriculum. Our teachers, the professors in college, really want students to use critical thinking. Uh, and yet, we don't often define it for you, so it's kind of hard to do it if you don't know what it is. I thought it might be useful just to lay it out. What is this thing called critical thinking? Well, uh, I'm sorry, if you do some research on it, you'll find that there's many different approaches to critical thinking. And I've just come up with my approach, and maybe you'll find it differently somewhere else. But at least this is a good starting point. And I'm, I've just listed some components of good critical thinking. First, seeing both sides of an issue. In other words, not being closed-minded. Being closed-minded and not seeing the other side of an issue is, bad, is not critical thinking. So we like our students to question things. That is how we can move forward, by questioning our assumptions. Every now and then we find out one is wrong. And when we do that, we learn something new. We open up the door to new learning. Number two, being open to new evidence that contradicts your ideas. I am really amazed sometimes in my students who uh, I will set up a lab experiment and they'll get results and um, they will report what they think sh we should have gotten instead of reporting what we really did get. Uh, so you really um, often critical thinking involves just looking at what's in front of you and using logic to uh, come to a conclusion regardless of what your pre-existing ideas are. Apparently that is really difficult for people to be open to new evidence that contradicts your ideas. But that's an important component of critical thinking. Reasoning dispassionately. Basically I think what that means is being logical and not emotional. And so uh, there is no role it, um, for emotion in the scientific process. Now we're emotional creatures and so in a way you might say that's impossible but basically we try as much as we can to remove passion from our practice. Passion, uh, what I mean by that is not excitement but emotion, positive or negative. Um, just for instance, uh, I, I'll ex give you an example of a failure of this among some scientists I've heard of. There was a dispute between two scientists. They both published papers that contradicted each other. And in public, they were swearing at each other. They were being very uh, 
compassionate. They were not using reason to address their differences. So uh, we try it. We sometimes fail, but that's one component of critical thinking. If someone comes at you, to you trying to convince you of something using very emotional language, uh, they are not being critical thinking, they are not being scientific. I would, frankly, as a scientist, I would distrust them. Fourth, demanding that claims be backed by evidence. If someone tries to make a claim, for instance, that wearing copper bracelets will reduce your rheumatoid arthritis, I would say, what is your evidence for that? And I would look at that evidence very carefully. That would be critical thinking, not just assuming that what they say is true because it's groovy or because someone else says it's true or whatever. Evidence. Fourth, deducing and inferring conclusions based on available facts, that is, being logical. Deduction and inference are parts of logic, so critical thinking is logic based upon available facts. So that's, that gets back to the evidence part. So that's five steps, five steps of critical thinking. Uh, make sure you study those. They might show up on examinations, your weekly exams, and uh, in fact, they probably will. And um, there you go, critical thinking. I just wanted to say, though, I was doing some reading about this, and I found someone who said that critical thinking is hard to teach unless students have domain knowledge. This is a bit of a side. You don't have to know this for me. But basically, how can you apply critical thinking in these five ways to something you basically don't know anything about? If you know an awful lot about, say, nematodes in their environments, then you can use critical thinking when someone makes a claim about nematodes. But if you don't know anything about nematodes or copper, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, then it's going to be very hard for you to use critical thinking. But the more you know about a subject area, the better you are able to use critical thinking to advance it. So expertise counts. I think that's the bottom line here. Okay, another time for a break if you're feeling a little tired uh, because we're changing the subject and getting to something very central to our general education. What is this thing you call the scientific method? And here I present the steps in the scientific method, which you may have had in grade school and high school, and I hope you did. And I'll go through it pretty quickly. Number one, observe, question, and consider possible answers. This is the very beginning, the most creative part of the scientific method. You observe nature. You ask it a question. Why are those peacocks so colorful? Why are all male bird species and many other animal species, the male often is really fancy and the female is not so fancy? You observe, you ask the question, and you consider possible answers. Then you develop a testable hypothesis. For instance, I believe that I, I hypothesize that peacocks and other birds are fancy to attract mates. Is that testable? Yes, it is. I won't go into some of the possible tests because that's the third part. You need to develop a replicable experiment to test the hypothesis. So I want to focus on that term replicable. What does that mean? It doesn't mean you will replicate your experiment. It doesn't mean that you will do it more than once. But it means that somebody else who wants to do your experiment could do it. It can't be one and done and no one else can do it because then no one can check you. Replicability means that somebody else can check your work. Very important. Uh, a couple decades ago, someone thought they discovered cold fusion. That is, they could generate massive amounts of electricity without intense heat. Well, it turned out that their experiment wasn't really replicable and it was discredited subsequently. So that was important. All right, so you have designed an experiment, you perform it and gather the data. Number four, just really unbiased, very, very logical, just actually no logic involved. Just do what you said you were going to do and collect the data. Once you have the data, it's time to look at it. Analyze the data, form conclusions, form conclusions about the hypothesis. Was I, did my data support my idea about peacocks or not? And if so, good. If not, then hmm, maybe I need to suggest some future work in this area. Okay, so that's the last part of the scientific method, sort of. There is another extremely important part that is often overlooked. It must be published. 
very often people do experiments. I do them at home, but I don't publish them. So it's not really part of that pyramid of science until it gets published. Now, where would critical thinking be applied here? It would be applied throughout. You would be using um, logic and observation and trying to avoid passionate uh, uh, um, pleas for one solution or another. Uh, you would be very logical about um, how you analyze the data and so forth. So critical thinking is used throughout the use of the scientific method. But that's how it's usually presented, this yellow box. This is the scientific method. I'm sure you've seen it before. I am going to take this a step farther because it is so important because once, well, let, let me go this way. So after you get your results, you write your paper and you publish it. But how, what is the process by which it is published? You write it up and you submit it. Uh, for publication to some uh, reputable journal. And what happens is that photocopies of it are made and they are sent off to other people who read it and they judge it. They look at it. Is it logical? Does the experiment adequately test the hypothesis? Did they come to justifiable conclusions? Is it interesting? And if it fails at any of these, it will be rejected and this person will go back and cry because they just spent a lot of time doing this stuff or maybe they'll revise it and try it again and it'll go through that process again very often papers go through several rounds before they're finally accepted and published but that's not the end of it publication is not the end of it there are gazillions of papers that have been published and then just language they're never they languish they're never noticed and so very often a scientist will not just publish a paper but also go to conferences and present posters and and try to make other people pay attention if a paper is accepted and it gets a lot of attention then that is really good for the person who publishes it in many different ways uh, it makes them more popular. It makes a lot of people know their name. It helps them hire graduate students. It helps them get money to support their future research and their professional position. This is a social context in which science operates and it's important to understand. Um, we try as scientists to remain very objective but sometimes it does not it goes beyond objectivity and there's self-promotion and there's there's enemies and friends and it becomes all very dramatic just as in any other social context so to ignore that fact is to to really do science a disservice so um, it happens and uh, uh, science sometimes slips behind when people cheat and don't do things right but uh, we do the best we can to remain un unbiased and objective and uh, it limps forward and actually it, it flies forward. Progress of science just flies forward. Okay and we do all that stuff and uh, the material on these two slides basically uh, you don't, I'm not going to test you on it but I want you to um, pause this presentation, stop listening to me, read through this stuff, and meet me uh, at the end of the presentation. And I'll have some things to say. So go ahead and pause and read. One, two, three, pause. Okay, you're back. I am, uh, pause it again and read all this stuff. You don't have to memorize this stuff, just read through it. Ready? Pause. And then come back. Okay, here we go. Okay, so I just wanted to write all that other stuff to give you, again, a sense of the social context of, of the scientific method. And it is so important to me, I think, that I have actually designed one quarter of your grade to be an exercise in the scientific method. And uh, your next presentation on our Moodle site will explain what that is. But essentially, what you'll be doing is um, forming a hypothesis, testing it, running the experiment, gathering the data, and writing it up in a paper for this class, just as in that yellow box. But you will try to publish it in this class by submitting it and you will be submitting it to a group of students who will read your paper and you will be reading other students papers and judging their merit 
and looking for ways that it can improve and returning those papers and you will get your paper back and you'll revise it and you will improve it and you'll submit a final draft of your paper and it too will be submitted to a group of students who will judge it relative to other papers and there will be winners and losers just as happens in the real scientific world okay all the details of that are forthcoming um, but I hope you participate in it you try to do the best job you can and I actually hope you have some fun doing it uh, that concludes this lecture this picture is a picture of a lake in Kilatoa crater which is the westernmost volcanic crater in Ecuador and a source of deep beauty okay I'll be seeing you at the next presentation take care